coming from Romans the eighth chapter, which for where I'm going today gives the believer the big picture on how to handle whatever it is you're going through, and that includes you who are watching with us on television as well. So Romans 8, verses 16 through 18, and I'm, I'm reading, says these words, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider, says the Apostle Paul, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And all the church said, Amen. I want you to look at your neighbor and say these words to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. I'm too blessed to be stressed. See, somebody didn't get that. Somebody didn't get it. We got to give it one more time. Say, neighbor, neighbor. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Yeah. Now give God praise like you, like you know that's true. Are you praising him in the balcony? Are you praising him up there? Do I have some praises in the balcony? I'm too blessed to be stressed. If I were to ask you individually what's stressing you out right now, a myriad of answers will come forth. <laughs> Overtime, sick, help, stress, no sleep, you no know, fear, worry, anxiety, my savings, my, uh, my expectations, retirement, my job, my debt, headaches, you, you know, sitting right next to me. <laughs> that, that wasn't in the script. <laughs> and don't amen that one. I want you to have a wonderful Sunday. But there are a lot of things that cause us stress. And one of the things I have, as I've gotten older, I've become comfortable with who I am as a preacher. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to tell you, like in some churches, that just everything you pray for, you get. Everything, because what that does is, it sets you up for failure. It sets you up for disappointment. The reality is that life is difficult, and life is hard whether you're saved or not. Now, that's, tell your neighbor, now the preacher just telling us the truth. He's just telling us the truth. See, mature believers don't get into all of this, you know, I'm going to get you this. God told me you're going to get all that. Because we done been there, done that. We done, we done watched 10, 15, 20 years go by. So we know better than that. We, we know better. Sure, some of it come true. But God, and you watch how God is dealing with Paul and the other apostles, he does, they don't approach the gospel like that. That is something that just everything you name and claim, you get it. They, they do not approach the gospel like that. And I'm supposed to be preaching what they have been preaching. In other verses, along with my text verse, the apostle Paul seems to be making light of the seriousness of stress in our lives. No, no, 2 Corinthians 4 and 17. Now, note the wording. Very few of you are going to be honestly able to amen this based on what you're going through. For our light <laughs> and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The, some of the stuff you're going through ain't light to you, it's heavy. And note back in my text verse again, it's critical, Romans 8 and 18. Paul says, I consider our present sufferings. He said, it ain't even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I want to assure all of those who are listening to me today in the presence of the Holy Spirit that is filling this room, I assure you that Paul is not making light of yours or my stressors. Instead, he wants the believer to focus on who you are, not where you are. I'm going to work with my message. He wants you to focus on who you are and not just what you're going through. 
First and foremost, know that you have given your lives to Christ. You are a child of God, and can't nobody take that from you. Well, how do you know is the question. Well, how do I know I'm a child of God? Well, in this same chapter, Romans 8, verse 9, the apostle Paul says these words. He said, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. That's not my words. You must be born again. Some of you have been in church so long that you never ever repented. You never fully gave your life to Christ. I'm sorry, that membership is not going to count. Being a member at Victory is not like having your name written in the Lamb Book of Life. You got to have that relationship with God that you know you gave your life to Him and that you have the Holy Spirit. Do I have some spirit-filled folk up in here today? Well, how do you know you, well, you're being led by the Holy Spirit. You've been adopted into the family of God. And verse 16, again, of my text says that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's why sometimes you see the saints shouting. Some saints shout because they can't help it. Because the shout ain't coming from the outside. The shout is coming from the inside. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, the Spirit just starts moving. And what's happening? The Lord is having a testimony service with you. <laughs> when you're going through, you know, one of the best things about going through, even though I don't like going through, I'm like anybody else. But boy, don't the Holy Ghost know how to reveal himself to you when you're going through. My goodness, the way the God can come and touch you and move you. And nothing in the circumstance has changed. But the feeling... I got some negative things to say about feeling shortly, but I'm going to say right now, that's a good feeling to have God moving on the inside. And then Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 tells us the, the Holy Spirit is, is God's guarantee, his down payment, his earnest money. It said, you were included in Christ when you heard the message, the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. With a seal. Well, what's that seal? The promise, Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, and it says to the praise of his glory. So God's just not talking. When God says, you're going to be in heaven, you want to make it through, the first thing he does is to make a deposit inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit. So you tell your neighbor, so I know this thing is real. I know God is sincere. He put himself in me and in you. And if you know you're God's child and you're an heir, in verse 17, the scriptures again say, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, that we may also share in his glory. You see, an heir is a person who is legally entitled to inherit another's property or title based upon the other person's death. Now, I'm just going to be down to earth in this message. I have seen the way some inheritance were handled that literally destroy families. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen family members that were close let the land, let mama for, for a coat. Mama told me it was mine. Let a few thousand dollars. And let me tell you something, you really want to see ugly in the family, let there be a couple of bucks that are out there. You want to see, and sometimes, I'm just being frank, I would never say it to the people that is not my job, but sometimes it sickens my stomach to see how much people, I've had people more concerned about the money than the person who just died. Well, what'd they leave? What'd they leave? Didn't visit them in the hospital, never cared anything. Let me tell, if there's anyone listening like that here or uh, on, on television, I'm telling you something. God knows your spirit, your bad attitudes, your mo. He's got something for you. For us to turn on our family about money says some very 
bad things about us. As a, it says clearly that our values are based on things and not people. And I have seen it over and over. Now, I've not seen it all the time. I've seen other times where family members could care less. Their, their focus was on big mama who just passed, their, their cousin, the brother, the husband, the whole family bonded together. That's how it should work. And if you want to be frank, it's not a huge problem because, you know, I hate to say this, in the African-American community, most of the time ain't nobody left nothing anyway. We have the story of the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Esau being the oldest, Jacob the youngest, in the line of Jesus Christ. You want to see this sense of heir and inheritance again? You will see it in just a moment. The oldest child in the, in the Jewish culture the, were called the, the firstborn. The firstborn son had what's called the rights of primogenitor. And the rights of primogenitor meant that the oldest son got two-thirds of the inheritance. So it would be two-thirds versus one-third. And the reason for that was the fact that they wanted to sense that who the father was and what the father had would pass through through this eldest son. So it was very much valued in that culture. Very much valued. Well, Esau was the oldest Jacob, whose name means deceiver, was the youngest. A situation occurred. I want you to know this. It's in Genesis 25, verses 27 to 34. We're just going to scroll quick because I think you need to see the whole story. It said, the boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Tell your neighbor, say, there's some mess right there. <laughs> there's favoritism right there. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that lentil soup, this red stew. I'm famished. That is why he is also called Edom, because he came out red too. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. The right of the firstborn. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread, some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Brothers and sisters, I want you to be clear about life. What you don't value in life, you ultimately lose. I don't care if it's your marriage. I don't care if it's your health. I don't care if it's your, uh, lack, your, your uh, life itself. Whatever you don't value. It could be your career. Whatever you don't value, you ultimately lose because... Everything you value requires that you take care of it and protect it. It's all right. I'm going to preach my message. The Bible condemns Esau even though Jacob, as his brother, should have just simply gave his brother something to eat. That's why when we understand the people God ultimately used, it's just amazing in Scripture. Because later this same Jacob has his name changed to Israel and becomes head of the 12 tribes after God puts them down. That's not the story for today. But if you note in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17, note how the Holy Spirit responds to this situation. The scriptures read, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. We all know that man was not about to starve to death. What it reflected was he didn't care about the birthright. 
You see, brothers and sisters, it takes foresight and wisdom to defer until tomorrow what you can get today. That takes wisdom. You see, the believer does not have to do wrong to get their inheritance. Yours and my inheritance is by right. Nothing people or Satan can do about it. Note 1 Peter 1, 3 to 7. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 7. This should inspire so many of you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And note, into an inheritance that what saints can never perish, spoil, or fade. Hallelujah. This inheritance is kept, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kind of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor. When Jesus Christ is revealed. Both Paul and Peter make it clear the believer's inheritance is guaranteed, but also that suffering can't be avoided. I don't care what any preacher tell you, suffering cannot be avoided. As Paul himself said, if you're going to avoid suffering in this world, you're going to have to leave the world. You're going to get in a rocket ship and head to the moon. For the believer, the path of suffering is the path to glory. That's why we take solace as opposed to people who don't know Christ. We're on a path that leads to glory. Pain suffered due to who you are will always, always produce character in your life. Begin to wrap up. In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, the Apostle Paul said, we glory in our suffering. Well, why do we glory in our, in our suffering? Because, first of all, it produces perseverance. But then from there, perseverance produces character. And then character produces hope. And hope makes us not ashamed because God has flooded our hearts and minds with his love through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The old time saints used to put it this way, no cross, no crowns. You see, <clears throat> And I just need to be a little careful. Just bear with me a moment. Sometimes life is really about how you look at it. So I'm going to ask you all a question. When I, when I hit you, encourage the pastor and say, you're yeah, in my house. Or say, amen. Just something to encourage me. So my question to you is, you know, what's weighing you down? Is it sickness? Is it bills? Oh, I ain't had nothing for sickness or bills. Wow. Okay, well, let me, let me keep going. Is, 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 it, is it loneliness? Oh, I caught somebody over there. Is it, is it frustration? Is it disappointment? I say, what's, 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 what's weighing you down? Is it uh, taking care of your aging parents? Is it dealing with an adult child that is in trouble? All right, I'm getting there. Is it being lied and cheated on? Is it heartbreak from a loved one that has gone on to be with the Lord? Is it a marriage that you have done every... Now, you can't amen this one. They hear. <laughs> See, I ain't trying to set up for no future counseling sessions. <laughs> but is it a marriage you've been working on five, seven, ten years? It seems like the more effort you put in it, it seems like the worse it gets. Is it your career? You're in a job that's far beneath your abilities and your education level. 
I'm saying what's weighing you down. Anybody want to add a couple other things? I got two things left. <laughs> I just throw them in there. We'll just call these others. I want you to note something. On this scale that is meant to keep balance, all those things weigh down. So how can Paul be talking about light? momentary, all of these kind of little while. How can he be saying that when it's clear, just naturally, that these things weigh us down? I, I, I want to propose to you, and I want you to note something. I'm only picking up one thing. Paul said, he never said, that what you're going through is light and momentary alone. He said in comparison. See, Paul approached this from, you can't get away from all this stuff that you're going through, but to help you get through it, compare it with what God's got for your future. That in all things, God is working together for the good of those that love him, that you are more than a, than a conqueror, that you, you are a child of God, that heaven belongs to you, the kingdom of God belongs to you. When you understand that, see, when you understand that, all of that stuff now has been tipped the other way. And that's how you get through your stuff. Give God some praise up in this place. Here's what I'm here to tell you. Here's what I'm telling you. Here's what I'm telling you. As these things are in here. And change, I'm going to put one more thing over here. We don't need number one. I'm going to put another just so you can really see. I can just put a couple of things in here that outweigh everything over there. Well, Pastor Singleton, what are you saying? As I close, here's what I'm saying to you. For every hurt, there's a hallelujah. For every tribulation, there's a triumph. For every stressor in your life, there's an overcomer. For every suffering, it can't be compared to the glory that God will reveal in your life. Give him some praise. And look at your neighbor real fast. If you believe in my message, you can look to the left and you can look to the right and tell them these words. Did you hear what the pastor said? This is why I'm too blessed to be stressed. This is why I'm too blessed to be stressed. Tell your neighbor, God's got it. God's got it. I'm not worrying about it. God's got it. The old time saints used to put it this way, looking at the big picture. My good days outweigh my bad days so I won't complain. While you complaining, he can be getting the glory. While you complaining, he can be getting the honor. While you complaining, your stress levels can go down and you can shout hallelujah anyhow. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. 
And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org.